make a player feel rather than think. And um, you can do that in a non-Telltale game too. You just have to be coming at it with that approach. You're like, I, I want to bypass the part of your brain that's making rational decisions about where I'm going to go and what I'm going to do strategically. And I want to get to your part where you're coming from the heart about what you think you value, you know, friendship versus, um, you know, lo loyalty versus, you know, to one person versus a group or something like that. Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I'm your host, Carl Duke, and today I'm joined by Ryan Kaufman. Ryan is currently the VP of Narrative at Jam City, overseeing all narrative across their studios and games. He's been in the industry for over 25 years working at studios such as Telltale Games, Planet Moon Studios, and LucasArts. Today, we'll be talking about interactive storytelling, advice for those wanting to create more memorable and exciting stories in their games, and what Ryan thinks about the future of the industry. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of the Zero to Play podcast. All right, welcome Ryan to the show. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so I mean, this is another great conversation that stumbled uh, because of a viral game dev tweet on Twitter, like uh, a lot of these conversations have been. And you, you made a tweet about burnout and um, trying to provide tools for people to take care of themselves in the game dev industry, because that is quite a, a serious topic that affects a lot of people in a lot of studios. Um, just the nature of games uh, means that there's always work to be done. Uh, things are never 100% finished, and, and that creates a, a culture of... Um, it's, it's, just, it's really hard to kind of break that cycle. So we're going to touch on that today. But what I also loved is that you've had an incredible career as a narrative designer across some amazing companies. And I want to touch on your experience, your view of narrative and games and advice that, that people listening that might want to improve the storytelling in their games, um, what advice you'd have to, to share to them. So um, we'll be jumping around a few different areas. Um, but I guess just to start off on the topic of burnout, um, uh, I've just launched a game at the end of last year. Um, burnout wasn't like huge, um, but it, it was, you know, did, some people did um, have to work, you know, to, to deliver, you know, stable builds and, and things like that and, you know, day one patches and we, we had that kind of routine, uh, but I don't think it was as severe as, as some of the stories that I've heard and it wasn't like um, it was we were burnt out throughout the process of development it was only really leading up to release but um i'd love to know uh kind of from your perspective what what your definition of burnout is and what you think the the real problem is that we have in the industry at the moment yeah i mean this is a this is a big question the thing that i've realized um over the past year especially about burnout is that it isn't just one thing we talk about it like it's one thing and we use we have one word for it we say burnout but it's actually a really uh, individualized experience that some people come to burn out through, you know, 20 years of, of working in gaming and they, at the end of their career, they're like, I'm burnt out. And other people, I, I've had college students coming straight out of school who are like, I got burnt out um, in school. It was so much work. And burnout can be super temporary. It can be something where you've worked really hard and you're like I need to recharge before I can do any more but you expect that you kind of know yourself and you might know well in a month I'll be ready or you know I'll get back into it um, but it can also be kind of a permanent debilitating thing where you're uh, you almost can't see a way forward um, and and so it, burnout comes in a lot of forms and it, it you know it can manifest in and be caused by anxiety um, depression, hostile work environment. So that's something where you could leave it and burnout would get better. Um, it can be caused by schedule, um, emotional exhaustion. You might be, you know, swimming upstream so long that you can't do it anymore. A feeling of powerlessness. All these things are things that people have cited as, as symptoms of burnout. Um, and I guess for me, the definition then becomes really individual. So for different people, it's different things when they say burnout. Um, I almost always dig it a little bit deeper to find out, well, what do you mean by that? Actually, what are you experiencing? Um, and I think it's a really important question to ask ourselves when we feel burnt out. Um, because burnout takes your 
capacity for kind of self-reflection away. You feel so tired, you feel so hopeless that you kind of give up on that and you stop looking at maybe what's what's really going on. So I think it's helpful to look at like, what is it you're experiencing? Can you name the things that are occurring within you or your body and talk about, mm. you know, what does that mean? Yeah, um, I think the, the worst case scenario is hearing a story about, you know, a really talented developer that um, after a project launches, they, you know, leave the industry completely. Yeah. Um, and because they, they don't see kind of a way for them to pursue that passion in a, in a healthy way. Um, and what I love, though, is, um, is I feel like recently the, the topic of burnout is, has become, uh, you know, very commonplace. Um, it, it's very common that there's a, a stigma of, of burnout in the games industry. So I feel like a lot of studios, um, including the one I'm working at now, have made, have made a conscious effort to just attack it head on mm-hmm. um, and to be very uh, vocal about, um, you know, the word burnout, what it means. Um, making people giving people as much time in advance when like during the really busy periods and um, so I, it, it's hard because it's, it's such a problem that probably falls onto the you know the studio managers and, and how the projects are run and like how tight deadlines are um, which we could probably talk about for, for a long time but maybe maybe what would be valuable is, is talking about if someone was in a scenario and you know no one's perfect no studio is perfect but if someone was in a scenario that they were suffering with burnout uh, what advice would you give for them to just cope um, if they say can't resolve that situation you know say that they are working towards a game's launch um, what advice would you give them to cope with the burnout to the best of their ability during those really hard periods yeah that, that's I mean it's a tough question you probably get different answers depending on who you ask. I think there's some members of your team who could be suffering um, with imposter syndrome and high levels of anxiety, um, maybe related to the schedule, related to stress that's not being resolved. And so for them, something like, you know, a mindfulness type of exercise that they do every day um, that, that resolves the stress or somehow manages their feelings of um, not being good enough or whatever that you know that could help but you might have somebody who is a working mom and she's um, she's burning the candle at both ends and that's a really you know that's a tricky thing because then it becomes quite institutional where you're like I'm not just dealing with um, her her stress at work I'm also dealing with the stress at home and her role and what she thinks she has to fulfill so um, it's so important for people to really look at what it is that they're dealing with and realize there isn't a one size fits all solution and it has to be really individually tailored. Um, But the first thing is obviously to talk about it, right? So the first piece of advice, and that's the biggest thing for a lot of people is to admit that they're getting burnt out and start talking about it with someone who can help. and that could be somebody you trust, could be your HR manager, could be your therapist, could be somebody that you don't know yet that you need to reach out to. Um, but I think a large majority of people are just trying to soldier on. And so maybe my first piece of advice would be like, have, have you talked about it? Are you, you know, can you admit that, that burnout is a problem? Um, mm. Yeah, I think talking to your, uh, from from my, my personal experience, talking to your team, like the people that you directly work with, they'd probably be able to relate to, to what you're going through the most. Um, so even just sharing it with your peers, it doesn't have to be your like direct report, but just your people that are in a similar role that you spend your time with um, because they, you know, they might uh, feel the same way and, and have and need to talk about it as well. Um, uh, I also want to throw in just some basic like human uh, uh, balance um, advice so having enough sleep trying to you know make sure that you're getting enough sleep uh, drinking enough water and just basic things like that can really help with with your mental state I feel and just kind of um, navigating complex issues instead of just uh, letting letting your environment kind of dictate that um, definitely I think sleep is a big one for me personally <laughs> yeah sleep for sure and then I mean yeah people people might be experiencing sleep disturbance too as part of the stress cycle, right? Because the more that you get stressed Mm. out, it it will interrupt your sleep cycle. And so it sort of feeds upon itself in a nasty 
um, circle. And that's why that whole concept of self-care is really great, but it also has to be a daily thing, you know, like one bubble bath a month is not going to undo the stress of, of real burnout. Um, it really has to be a daily mm -hmm. practice, which is tough for some people to get their heads around that they can't put themselves first sometimes. And that, and that could be um, a real problem. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that that's some good advice. And, and what I liked about your thread is that the people that, that chimed in or it, it wasn't a thread, it was more just a call out for, for people that um, uh, are, you know, wanting to, to learn more or to, to be uh, part of a group that, that they can comfortably talk about burnout. So I'll definitely link that below if people want to connect with other people that have commented on that on that post, um, as well as maybe reaching out to you if, if you've developed, um, you know, lists for, for people to uh, reach out to whether they're in a certain role or in a certain country or wh whatever it might be. Um, so just, just tying, tying it up on that, um, what, what was the outcome of, of that post and, and what's your current um, uh, stance? Like what conversations have you had from that post that, that you put out? Well, the goal for me was to uh, judge how many people would be interested in a burnout like support group, basically, um, and that I wanted to do something on a regular basis. And um, as of now, I'm still collecting names and times. It's actually not that easy to coordinate as well as you <laughs> might guess. We're a global industry, and so being able to coordinate everybody at a certain time and place uh, is not easy, but I still think it's a worthwhile effort. Um, and I'm also reading as much as I can about it and and kind of getting into it. But so the goal is for 2022 to really start this group and it'll probably be an online group. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll be able to talk about, you know, w w ways to help each other and methods that work or um, ways of thinking about burnout that maybe people haven't mm -hmm. considered before. Yeah, I quite like that. I, I almost feel like a, a Discord channel could be could be handy where it's like asynchronous conversation, but there's also voice channels if people want to like have like a, a, a meeting at a scheduled time to talk amongst each other. That, that could be um, helpful. But that's that's awesome that that you've you know put yourself out there and that that this is a, a goal that you want to achieve. I I find that awesome, and it's it's great to to see people like yourself in the industry just trying to. Um, get people to talk more and and learn more because uh, that's how the industry matures and becomes a, a safer and, and healthier place to work um so yeah that's i, I almost feel like the this podcast is going to be two very completely different uh, corners but i'd love to to move over to like narrative design and, and i have some really interesting questions that i've collected uh that i'd love your perspective on uh that i think you'd be able to um give some really really great uh, perspective on so the first question I have is um, as a game developer so you're, you're developing a game and we, we're going to talk very broadly because there's so many different types of genres and platforms and things but what advice do you have for um, a game developer wanting to bring their player into the story of their game um, and I, I would just like I want to keep that broad and I want to hear kind of what uh, comes to mind when uh, when that question is asked so what 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 advice do you have for a game developer trying to bring a player deeper into the story of the game? Mm, great question. Yeah, we could probably have a whole hour just talking about that. <laughs> I mean, all the theories and all the methods. Um, I think the, the probably the first place to start is to look at uh, how does the player experience of the game uh, sit on top of or mesh with a story that you might want to tell. So, um, you know, and a lot of games kind of attempt to do this, but if, if you are telling a story of the rise of a hero, that maps pretty well onto a player who's starting at level one and growing to level 50. Um, and those are the kind of things that we look for when, when we're trying to get a player deeper into the story, because the sense that the story being told as the narrative portion echoes or resonates with the story being told of the player experience. In other words, oh yeah, I collected this armor and now I kind of look cooler and more like a hero. And the more that I do, the more I fulfill this role. And, um, you know, I'm fighting dragons now, whereas I started by fighting mice in the basement. 
and that, you know, it's a pretty common way to do it, but I believe in it. Um, and the other thing to do is obviously you want to bring in the NPCs and the characters that will help them, that will help reflect who they are and um, the values of the game or the values that maybe you want to challenge in the player um, to get them kind of into that into that experience and draw them deeper in someone they can care about um, rather quickly or something they can care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. That's, I mean, already that's some really great advice. The, the, hero's, the hero's journey, like you mentioned, I feel like is the, the three-act structure that you see, you see from film. It's kind of the, um, uh, the, the easy structure that you can build if, if you're looking for something simple, um, similar to how you know, films have the, the three-act structure. Um, one thing I want to ask you, and this is something that I've seen a trend of in the last few years, um, is sandbox style games so games that um, I mean I think the battle royale genre kind of um, plays on this thread as well um, I think uh, things like Fortnite creative and Roblox where they're um, you know relying on the the kind of players to be the developers and to create their own experiences I feel like there's a big trend in kind of sandbox style games these days that don't really revolve around uh, a clear like beginning and end uh, narrative and I'd love to know your thoughts just from someone that that works in games on on and as a as a narrative um, as a narrative designer what are your thoughts on like sandbox style games where the player kind of creates their own narratives um, and and how that pairs with maybe like a traditional game um, like an uncharted that you know guides you through all these chapters um, like do you do you see those as like opposites do you think that they they mend together uh, are they like different categories in the games industry that you kind of split it up in at the moment yeah i was just joking on twitter this morning about like i was saying we need a new we can't use hero's journey anymore we have to come up with a new game version of that you know the big difference is being in games the hero starts with an with an outrageously uh outsized sense of their own abilities and that they're actually not that good you never see that in stories you always the humble farmer grows into the night you know but in games it's the opposite they come in thinking i could do this and then we proceed to beat them down for 50 levels um there's this quest for like these meaningless objects they don't have any meaning really in the story but they're like little things that you need could be pieces of weapons pieces of armor you know coins tokens all that stuff almost like an ocd you just never see this in a hero's journey like heroes running around collecting things like to that extent that don't have anything to do with their larger story and then ultimately a lot of these stories in the sandbox games do it too your victory is actually when they turn you loose into the kind of live event or the open world part of the game where basically you just keep doing that over and over and then to me, I was joking that it was like, it's like a purgatory almost. You end up in a place, your reward for finishing is you get to do it over and over and over again. <laughs> um, and like, you know, I was joking, but I think also it's true that there are, are tropes and storytelling um, behaviors in games that we've never really seen before, except maybe in like playground type of play where kids engage in open-ended um, play that has no form to it other than what they bring um, and that's what I see in a lot of these sandbox games the places that I see the opportunity for more traditional narrative are kind of along along the outsides of the frames of it like the, the Minecraft um, games that had so much lore that came up um, outside of of kind of the main game experience like um, I remember people being obsessed with like Hero Brian. Like they they had found this character that was in the code, and they thought there was some larger meaning to it. Um, and like that's really, I think, where a lot of the story exists for those sort of sandbox games. Is it's around the perimeter, and it exists as lore or world building or something that's a little more passive. 
Yeah, uh, I, I find it really interesting. Um, an example that I think uh, I'd love to touch on is is what Riot Games are doing with um, Arcane and League of Legends and having like cross media mm. storytelling. Um, because so, for example, I I play Valorant, which is uh, you know another game by Riot Games, and what I've noticed it's a you know first person shooter uh, turn based like strategy game but in the voice um clips of the players um they've started adding little teasers to um relationships that the characters have between each other and it seems like a clear way that they're stuck so initially it was just the environments and the characters that were really the only story really involved um there wasn't really much more story beyond that but um, I can see them starting to, to tease out these little relationships between the characters that I can almost see turning into, you know, a Netflix series uh, one day. And, and I'm curious to see if that's like a trend that, that games are having where they, they do the world building and the character building and then they go to another medium like film to do the, the actual storytelling and the, the arc. I know Apex Legends does a similar thing with their, their comics and their um, like short films that they do. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think they, um, do, you, do you see that trend um, and do you think that they can like exist within this, the same game or do you, do you think that it's, it's a nice trend that they're starting to separate? Yeah, no, I think that's that's exactly right. There is a trend towards that, and I, um, it comes from a lot of different sources within the game teams. You have at the very top, obviously, the executives who, if they feel the property has value outside of just the game, that they would love that, right? Who wouldn't love to also have a TV show going and a movie, and it all adds value to you know, the, the overall property. But then, of course, at the, at the lower levels, you have the team themselves, and I've known many writers and, and game devs who love the property so much they almost can't help but put in those little details that sort of suggest a larger story because in their heads you know when you're a game dev you also have headcanon about what's going on especially if you're working on a game that doesn't have strictly speaking you know a telltale style narrative or whatever where there's a very strictly defined story path you make up little stories in your head about who the units are and what they care about and how they relate to each other. And um, so, yeah, I see that current trend continuing. And, and of course, on the, you know, the Netflix side or the uh, movie side or comic side, they're looking for material that's been developed and has some thought put into it and has a, uh, a base of people who are passionate about it because that makes for a better bet for them. So um, I think it's mutually beneficial to keep continuing along that and what we see in the last 10 years is kind of more respect for narrative um, uh, in, the, in the overall games industry so they're more likely to employ writers and they're more likely to employ people who are good at storytelling on a team that may otherwise a while back might have just been uh, you know engineers and designers who kind of weren't thinking as much about that so we're likely to see more and more of it I think as the years progress. Yeah, do you, do you feel like we're seeing less and less of, of branching narrative games? Uh, I, I feel like that, I, I think it still exists at, at like an indie level, but at like a AAA level, I feel like that um, isn't as popular as, as things like um, Battle Royale, the Battle Royale genre and, and world, world building uh, type games. Um, what are your thoughts on, on branching narrative games? Do you, do you think that they, they still have a place in the industry? Um, they're really cool, but they're very expensive in terms of the bang for the buck because every branch is more or less bespoke um, and again I think the industry right now is fascinated with games that just have an open-ended gameplay that and um, you know a pay-as-you-go model that that they can keep generating revenue um, the branching narrative game is almost always going to be pretty finite so um, the next big leap for branching narrative games will be when we can unlock procedural narrative so that mm. the branches are no longer defined by a strict content pipeline where it's like I created branch A, B, and C. You know, Now it'll be an AI that'll handle any A, a B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever we can kind of throw at it. Um, that'll be the next big leap and we might see another evolution when that technology mm -hmm. matures. That's exciting. I, I did, uh, someone else on, on the podcast mentioned a, like AI storytelling and, and um, 
you know procedural narratives um how would that work like if someone was starting to just think about in the back of their heads maybe they're working on a project but they think maybe their next project will encompass um you know an ai narrative like what kind of things should they be thinking about in terms of the constraints in that system like are you are, do you do you understand how it will work enough to be able to 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 kind of explain a bit more you know what like will you need to come up with like a list of characters and then like assets and then um you know text and then that just kind of chooses one at random um how is it going to work <laughs> <laughs> i think the best version of it is um not something that just generates story for the sake of story but is rather a replacement for a really good you know dm or or game master um who the player is really still driving the game or the story but that ai is able to go and react to um i went left instead of right or i decided to go away from the dungeon and off into the mountains um because that's how i felt that day or um you know i decided to turn from a good person into a thief and and so everybody in the world is going to reflect that change that to me is the best version of of like ai storytelling in the sense that we're not using it to make a new script you know like you kind of see these ai that will generate a new harry potter script you know based on which is impressive in a way but it's like that's a sort of a misuse of the technology and it has a way better application as more of a reactive or simulated um game master guide yeah i um I, I read an article recently talking about just the amount of data that game studios are getting now on their players because it's it's an interactive medium you can really you know categorize your players into um what their personality type is and and kind of anticipate what their next movements will be um and i feel like that the ai storyteller like system would, would be similar to that where you know there's a lot of psycho psychology involved um which is kind of scary and i just wanted to touch on that because you know there there might be stories in the future of, of people like misusing that technology um but i think if we're just you know keeping a, an optimistic view that is a really exciting um uh you know situation uh, and i i think the the way that i liked um how you explained it is it's almost like a sidekick that's like coming along with you and developing like like you said like a dm um, that's developing the story as you go rather than something that's just predetermined they know exactly how you're gonna act for the next six hours of gameplay mm -hmm. um, and then to you know put microtransactions at the exact point that they know you're the most vulnerable yeah yeah <laughs> you know it's gonna get used for that too though <laughs> totally yeah yeah um i just hope that it's public enough that we can talk about it like this yeah. in a way that you know we know maybe maybe i'll get like a an ai storyteller dev on the show and then we can we can find out all the <laughs> hidden secrets of, of what players actually do yeah. um yeah so um i um i read uh, on your linkedin it says that you're an expert in making games emotionally compelling um and i wanted to ask you that question just because i think making games uh, emotionally compelling is is an interesting way to frame it because i feel like games are really good at um um the the kind of physical side of immersing you in an environment and the emotional side i almost would say a medium like film is a lot better because they're, they're telling you um or they're, they're, they're telling the story to you right in front of you whereas a game is more action-based so um I feel like ma making a game emotionally compelling is a real big challenge for game developers. So I'd love to know what your um, what your tips and, and advice is for, for people wanting to get that emotional experience out from, from a player. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so the first big thing that I kind of learned even back at LucasArts in the early days was that a story, it really needs to be explained from an emotional point of view rather than um you know don't don't come tell me the story of uh lord of the rings is about a little hobbit that journeys across the land and throws a ring into a mountain like it's about a little person who has no power and no business being out into wider world has to c overcome their fear and do the most amazing thing they've ever done in their lives um and then come back 
and feel actually changed to the point where they can't ever go home again, which is a sad ending of, of the Lord of the Rings, which actually makes it such a compelling story as if, you know, um, that's why we care about Frodo is because he really does sacrifice even though he comes home. And I started realizing like so many video games are about the physical things that happen. We got to go here and blow up the missiles and then, you know, raid the radar tower or whatever. And they never really talk about what's the emotional underpinning of that. Like, why do I care? Is this, is my hero a person who's overcoming their fear? Is my hero overcoming whatever so now we have a lot more of that and you'll see it all the time in these uh so-called dad games like god of war you know whatever or you know or, or um yeah like multiple games where some man has to take care of a little girl and that makes him more emotionally vulnerable and and we're all kind of rolling our eyes now but it's coming from that place of saying okay maybe this story should be about an emotional mm -hmm. journey as opposed to a physical journey um mm -hmm. And the second part of that is then to create choices, and I learned this at Telltale, is to create choices that um, make a player feel rather than think. And um, you can do that in a non-Telltale game too. You just have to be coming at it with that approach. You're like, I, I wanna bypass the part of your brain that's making rational decisions about where I'm gonna go and what I'm gonna do strategically. And I wanna get to your part where you're coming from the heart about what you think you value you know, friendship versus, um, you know, lo loyalty versus, you know, to one person versus a group or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And really challenge what players think they value versus what they really value or what they can tolerate in the game. Um, and that's where you get to a really emotionally compelling game because that's something you can't put down. You'll be thinking about it later in the shower and you'll go, did I side with the right person or was I a dick to him or like, you know, these kind of ruminations that we have later on that are a sign that the game's really got under your skin. Absolutely. One one example that, that comes to mind that I played recently was Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. And um, there's a few things I want to touch on with that game that I'd love your perspective on. Uh, but little, little moments in that game that I absolutely loved were after you've kind of become an expert at, um, at the combat, you... Um, you have to actually lose a fight to continue to progress the story like if you continue to, to to defeat the bosses they just keep spawning and keep spawning and and you have to just kind of like listen to the to the voices and listen to what they're trying to say and they say you have to give up um, and and that was an incredibly powerful moment for me because you know I'm very competitive I'm very um, you know I love getting uh, you know mastering the combat and and that was an, a really powerful moment for me that that was the the kind of moment that stuck to me when i was in the shower going wow like that was they were really clever to to make me stop like become like you know becoming a master at, at, at combat um and another thing that i liked about that game was the the game how the game mechanic um involved the um the psychosis of the voices in in her head um, and I'm assuming that you've played it, but you're nodding as if as if you you're familiar I with it. I haven't not played um, it. No, no, no. But I know okay, kind of what so, you're talking about. So there's there's a great game mechanic where um, there's uh, this lady that that suffers with psychosis, and she has voices in her head. But those voices actually guide you when you're going in the wrong direction, or when you're getting close to um, like a rune that has vital information. Um, or when you're about to die, like the voices kind of get louder. And what I love is how the the game mechanic has infused with the the narrative and the character building. Um, and I think that those examples in games are the ones that really are the most powerful for me. And I'd love to know from your perspective, um, uh, or do you have any examples or advice for people wanting to create game mechanics? So this is going beyond narrative it's actually speaking at a system and feature level of how those features and systems can um influence the narrative and the character building and the world building of the game do you do you know what i'm do you know what i'm talking about do you have any like thoughts on that oh absolutely like that's a i think a constant uh constant challenge for for game dev teams is to understand that the story writers or the narrative people and the game designers actually need to talk constantly because when those things get divided, 
um, it feels really bad. Then you end up with games where you kind of have that what they call ludo narrative dissonance, where you're you're gunning down people to get through the level, and then the cutscene is all about we got to restore peace to this society. You know, like, um, but yeah, I, I I'm a strong believer that um, narrative and design need to talk constantly, and that when you get mechanics like you're talking about that feel like they literally are coming out of the character, but they're actually there as affordances in the game, um, you know, that's amazing, right? And you remember those because they're so well integrated. It just all feels like it's pulling together um, as opposed to mm. just, oh, why don't we give the player a radar on the screen so they can find objectives? And then you're thinking, well, actually, why don't we give them a voice to represent the psychosis mm. that helps them find those things? Um, because then, you know, the story and the game design is pulling together and the player really feels like this is my experience, this is what's happening to me. Yeah, and, and what I what I find really hard when navigating this conversation is that it's very creative. There's no uh there's no easy way to suggest this for uh you know, someone's game. It's 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 a it's an art form and it's a it's a way that you interpret it and that's what I love the most about games and that's why I love narrative designers because they're coming from a a creative emotional perspective and and when that gets infused in the um in the design of the game it, that's when I think unique experiences that that feel like games uh, as an art form come out um and uh, do, do you from from your you know experience or any games that you've played um when you think of games as an art form uh what what kind of games come to mind and and why why do you think of those as a form of art um yeah there were two and now I've, I, i'm the worst with titles um edith finch i think was the name of it you play spoiler uh a woman kind of researching her family history um what remains of edith finch that's what it was called um and it was excellent it was all first person but you're playing through the stories of all of your family members who spoilers again they've all died um but you can play through those experiences and it actually tells you a little bit more about your family tree and um making those playable experiences literally in the shoes of these family members uh was so powerful and bringing it all together um i mean it really did elevate it to an art form in the sense of it was such a cohesive um, self-contained experience that I, you know, I would say yes. That, that's like where it really starts to approach, approach art more than yes, it's a fun game, but it's not just there to win. It's actually there to, you know, kind of you end up growing a little bit. You end up thinking about mm. your world in a different way. So, yeah, that's a good. That was mm -hmm. a great one. There was another one, just a little mobile game called Florence, and Florence was a like this wonderful little game about a relationship that develops and blossoms and, and goes bad but it was all told through mechanics you're just tapping on these people as they're trying to talk to each other and sometimes um, when the relationship was fractured you were putting together or trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle that was them you know like I think that they were embracing or something and you're trying to put these pieces together but the game is actually moving the pieces away from each other and so you really get mm. that sense of like this is what it's like to try and put together the pieces of a relationship that's just not working and you're trying your best mm. to make it fit. And so I felt like, you know, that's a little piece of art too. Um, and, it, and you couldn't really get the same thing by, it, it wouldn't work as a painting or a movie. Uh, you have yeah, to play yeah. it, you have to experience it. Experience it. That's, yeah, and, and that's what makes me incredibly motivated about just pursuing games and staying in, in this industry is that there's so much more to explore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as there, there's more platforms arising than there are artful games, in, in, in my opinion. Or, the, you know, there's some great examples out there, but like VR as a medium, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of stories that you can tell through there. Even, you know, mobile is, is unexplored in a lot of ways of, um, yeah, I, like there was, a, there was this game, I can't remember it, what it was called it was called like maybe astronaut or something like that and you're you're this person on a planet and it's just everything's text-based and you're just kind of clicking through learning about a character but it feels very natural because it's it's almost like you're reading messages on your phone from you know one of your friends and it's um it's just amazing how that kind of makes you connected to this character in a, in a unique way 
um, and I just I love experiences like that, like that. and and the, the best is when the, the sound design really helps set the tone um, the visuals as well um, and, and it's yeah that, that's what I love most about games is that there's just so many unique ways of infusing interactive content um, to tell a story or to, to create like a piece of art um, that's what what's really exciting um, I, I would love to know um, a bit about there's, there's only a, a few more questions that I have left but um, uh, talking about your role this is kind of more of a corporate game dev question um, so you're you're the VP of narrative at Jam City right now and I'd love to know how um, just from someone maybe they're, they're just starting out or they're part of a small studio with like a dozen people uh, I'd love to know what the hierarchy looks like of how um, it goes from your role all the way down to the the bottom of like the narrative hierarchy is uh, if you're allowed to share of course um, of like how it actually works getting narrative into um, into the games and it might be different from studio to studio so um, if you could just like pick an example to try share some insight and and how the structure of actually getting narrative done at, at Jam City works that'd be awesome oh sure yeah and it, and it is different from studio to studio um, Jam City uh, actually inside of it contains multiple studios. We have one in San Francisco and LA and Berlin and Toronto and Bogota, they're all over, there's, there's multiple. Um, so my role is in that case much more, um, I don't, I don't uh, there are directors at the studio levels who are directly responsible for the narrative designers, which is great because they can manage their careers. They can, they're more hands-on day to day. Um, and my role is to look at more high level and think, where are we going a year from now with this game? What high level does this game need? Maybe more so than, than um, a director could look at given their time and budget, um, what they're doing every day. So my purpose is to look a little more high level, um, but then also occasionally get involved and directly and help, you know, if, if, uh, if a story isn't quite coming together, hopefully, you know, I can, lend some experience to that and say maybe try this try that um but that's what it looks like for the most part so uh you know at the vp level like i'm looking at all of the games or all the studios and trying to think about how they all fit into sort of the jam city portfolio if you will um mm -hmm. and then the individual designers are you know within their studios working on their games in their studios um at, at a more kind of personal local level does that make mm -hmm. sense yeah yeah no definitely it's like it's almost like you're a you're a mentor to these these studios um to to be able to you know uh, I be be a resource when when they um reach like a, a hurdle um does does narrative cover uh everything from so the story do, do, does it involve characters and creating new characters and what about environments and things like that are they are they covered in different roles, or is that all? Um, good? Does that all go through you as well? Um, no, that that definitely is per game. So on every individual game, um, the story team is going to work with the art department. You know, in terms of we need an environment that looks like this, and it has to be really creepy. And so they get concept art going, and they they all kind of pick together. And, um, yeah, so the, in that sense, the creation of that stuff happens at the studio level. Um, and I'll come in and I'll push for things sometimes that I see in a necessary need for. Like, you know, we need a really sympathetic character in this story. We don't have one who's the voice of, um, you know, maybe we want to, maybe the theme is like being merciful to people who don't deserve it. So I go, oh, we really need that character in there. And can we get that character working or, or whatever? Um, Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it, it, the story teams generally work on outlines for whatever story is happening. So if it's Harry Potter, they're going to work on the outline for a quest. Um, and that's going to work very closely with the animators, very closely with the artists um, and the producers. Make sure it's in scope and do we have enough budget? And this is what we thought we were uh, you know, going to get. And then... I'll work with them in, in, in addition to the directors on things like how are the choices feeling in the proposal or the script? Uh, how, yeah, do we need a character tweak here? Um, is the IP being represented? Do we have enough Harry Potter stuff in this 
in this mm. quest mm-hmm. to make it feel like a part of the universe. So that that that's yeah, that's what that looks like. That's awesome. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, I I just want to ask one more question, and I, um, I I like that we spoke about the AI storyteller earlier, but if we if we're not talking about that, I'd love to know um, your your kind of thoughts on the future of interactive storytelling um, in the games industry. Maybe maybe what you what you hope to see um, gets you know. Um, put more like more time more projects in at, at, at like a, a global level of of like the kind of narrative projects you'd like to see in the world i, I just kind of want to pick your brain on on what uh what you'd like to see uh happen in the world of of games in the next like five ten years from like a narrative narrative perspective is there anything you feel like is really missing or needs to be explored more that you'd like to say yeah two things um First of all is is narrative in VR. I feel like we've only just barely scratched the surface of what's going on there, but the power of the immersion in VR, um, you know, if you've played it, you know, it's like you're just in those worlds and it's quite amazing. Um, so adding st- really good storytelling or really robust storytelling on top of that is going to be amazing. Um, and we're just barely there, but but you know I hope we keep going with it. I see good things in in the next couple of years. And the other thing that I really want to see that no one's really done is the um, integration of music and storytelling. You know, um, mm. musicals are a very popular form of entertainment. There's almost no there's no corollary in games. Uh, why don't we have musical games? You have musical episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You know, and musical. Uh, um, animated films for kids um why isn't music more part of our storytelling toolbox and it could be and it could be really cool to do participatory in fact um i just started to play this uh mobile game just came out it's called insecure and it's based on the hbo show um and it's uh, kind of a it's a narrative based game, but one of the mini games is you basically are like freestyle rapping, and you can throw words in to try and rhyme, you know, your couplets or whatever. And like when you do well, you do well, and, and you get more words. And I just loved it. Like I instantly fell in love with this mechanic, and um, the characters around you react to how well you're doing, and um, you can kind of hype yourself up before a big moment. By doing it in the mirror, and and um, I thought that's great. Like, we should we should do more of that, please. Yeah, that's awesome. I I love the love the thought of that. And when I see the first um, uh, Frozen uh, mobile game musical yeah. experience, I'll think <laughs> yeah. of you because I, I it's definitely coming. It's it's definitely uh, and and just there's so many different ways that game mechanics could be used to help create a, a cool experience was um with a musical uh so that's that's a really good uh thing to touch on and, and who knows someone listening to this might be inspired and to create um to create something like That'd that so amazing. uh thank you so much for your time ryan uh, i really appreciated the the topics that we talked about um the the way you were able to to simply convey your um um you know, your your career and narrative and the kind of uh, stories that are told in games uh, I think that um, it, it sounds really simple when you say it but I think a lot of people struggle to um, put those into words in like a in a concise way so really appreciate your experience and um, and, and you uh, telling your story on, on this podcast so um, if anyone's interested I'll, I'll have links below to Ryan's uh, LinkedIn and Twitter it's um, at Mr. Fox uh, with a one as the I um, but everything's linked below if you want to go follow Ryan um, definitely reach out to him and um, he's uh, he's lovely he he'll answer all your questions and um, if you want more resources on burnout um, or if you're struggling with burnout I'm sure Ryan would love to hear from you um, and yeah so uh, just before we, we close out, if I was to ask you to give three um, uh, pieces of advice for someone that has just created their pitch to their game and they're starting development, three three pieces of advice to um, be mindful of 
of the like narrative in their game uh what advice would you give them so this is um to make sure like that they've included in their pitch if they're like seeking funding um what would what three pieces of advice would you give from a narrative perspective for them to include oh wow um let's go back to that emotional what is the emotional story so forget your story can you tell me what's the relatable like is it a story about growing up is it a story about you know what what's it what's the beating heart of it um and that's what that's how you're going to connect with potential investors because they'll recognize that um more so than they'll connect with whatever new fiction you've developed on top of it that'll come later but start with that emotional beating heart um the second thing is uh come up with a hook what's what's your hook like how does what is the sentence that you can say that makes the person lean in and and, and ask okay tell me what happens next um if you don't have that or you can't get that reaction from people you might need to work on it um because again that's that's what an investor is going to look for and, and ultimately that's what a player will look for too and they, we all have choices of 500 games came out this month you know what's the one that hooks you um and then the third one is you know make it personal um whatever your whatever genre you're working in look inside of you and put something in there that's that's from you even if it's embarrassing or weird especially if it's embarrassing or weird because those are the details that make us love what we love um you know george lucas put all the things he loved about flash gordon and um into star wars and, so, and they're goofy like but that's why we we love it so put something personal in there too Perfect. Thank you so much, Ryan, for your time. And uh, I wish you a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I hope you learned something about game development, the games industry as a whole, or the future of games. You can follow us on Twitter at Zero to Play, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Spotify, or any other podcasting service. Other than that, you can find links to this episode down in the description below. And I'll see you guys next week for the next episode.